community online for women. It is a place that women go to get career advice. They can leave and read anonymous reviews about what it's like to be a, be a female at the company. They can join communities and groups and start discussions. They can even do so anonymously. And they also can search and apply for jobs at companies that care about diversity and inclusion. We are becoming the daily habit for career-minded women and a resource that you can use at every part of your career journey. And because of that, we're an expert in the space in a lot of places. And one of the pieces we're gonna talk about today is how to advocate for yourself and how to be promotable in everything that you do. Now, my personal story is I spent the majority of my career in sales and sales leadership at Fortune 500 technology companies. And through the majority of my career, um, I was almost always the only woman on my team, sometimes the only woman in my management group, sometimes the only woman in my department. And throughout my journey, I actually spent over 10 years at one particular Fortune 500 company where I started as an executive, I moved into Fortune 1000 sales, I then became a manager and managed three different small to medium sized business teams in the business to business space. I went on to be a global enterprise manager, consulting and building the relationship with two global 500 companies. And I ended my career there as a managing partner where I ran a global sales division for them. I did all of that in 10 years. And during that time, I was one of the youngest people in the country um, in the history of the company to be in that role and one of the few women. And while on paper, that sounds like an incredibly successful career, and it was, there were a lot of mistakes I made <laughs> and a lot of things I learned along the way that I wish I would have known that I'm gonna share with you today. So thinking about this from where we are in this world of 2020 filled with all the things that are happening, we are in unprecedented times and we're in really a crisis workplace. And at some points it's been called a recession as well. And there's three types of people that engage in this workforce. There's people that put their heads down and they work business as usual. There are people that learn how to innovate and pivot in their roles. And whether that is continuing your, continuing your education, developing yourself, thinking of new and better ways to improve processes, that is an opportunity. And the third type of person in this environment is someone who's looking to be promoted. Now, maybe you're thinking, this is crazy, Allison. My company has done layoffs or they're not giving raises, they're not doing promotions, we're really leaning down. And that is probably true for a lot of companies and a lot of people out there right now. But the interesting thing about this is this is also an opportunity to shine and to put yourself in a position where you can help your company and be seen as a leader and as the type of person who should be taken to the next level. And part of the interesting part of my story working in the Fortune 500 world is that I built my management career during the Great Recession. And I took those opportunities when my companies, the company I'd worked for had leaned down, had restructured, I took those opportunities to put my hand up and say I wanted more responsibility. And it ultimately changed the course of my promotion path and my success at that company. So it definitely is possible and we're in a unique opportunity right now where we can look at that again. And why this is so important from the female standpoint is I don't know if you've seen this really scary statistic, but according to the World Economic Forum, if we just keep moving at the pace we're moving right now in terms of diversity and equality, we are still over 200 years away from true global gender parity in the workforce. And I don't know about any of you, but for me, that is way too long to wait <laughs> to see enough women in leadership, to see women with equal pay, to see women of diversity represented on boards and in across organizations and underrepresented departments and roles. So the moral of this comment is that we need to really activate. And in particular, while there are a lot of challenges that women in particular face in the workforce, we can't always control the external environment that we work in or the people we work with or the structures and the thoughts that are in place. But what we can do is advocate for ourselves to the maximum level to make sure that we can put ourselves in the best position to succeed. And there have been a lot of studies that show that women are more likely to be top performers but they are less likely to be promoted. And why this is important is a lot of it comes down to a very simple concept. When I was early in my career, I, like most women, believed if I did a good job, if I met and exceeded expectations, if I was a hard worker, people would notice and they would promote me. <laughs> and that was the very first mistake I made in my career, is it assuming I would get a raise or be promoted just based off the fact that I was good at my job. And this is important because men 
typically are advocating for themselves in terms of financial compensation and also their career growth, but women expect that people will notice. And the truth is, maybe sometimes you are noticed, but for the most part, we have to make sure we are noticed and we have to be loud about it and talk about it often. Fairy Godboss did a study asking men and women if they'd ever asked for a raise or promotion. And no surprise, men were more likely to ask for a raise and more likely to ask for a promotion. And I have an old mantra I've said for a long time, but if you don't ask, the answer is already no. So you might as well ask and begin that process. And I have found even as a hiring manager that in the interview process over the years I've hired candidates, I was surprised how many women took the first salary that I offered them and how many men, which every single one of them, negotiated for a higher compensation package. And so really it's about understanding what the market looks like and making sure you're asking out of the gate. So in talking about how to be promotable in everything that you do, there are three main components. The first is your performance at your current role. And that's something that I can't help you with today. But I will tell you of the three components, it is the least important of the three. The second of the most important components is your personal brand, which we're gonna discuss. And the number one is your relationships. And again, going back to that idea where if you do a good job, you'll be noticed and you'll be recognized. That might be true in terms of your performance, but your personal brand and your relationships are gonna be the two pieces of this puzzle that really drive your career to the places you want it to go. If you've ever seen Carla Harris speak, she is by far one of the most dynamic speakers I've ever seen. And she is an executive at Morgan Stanley. She built her career as a diverse woman on Wall Street in the 80s and 90s. And now she is at the top of the ladder. And when she discusses what it's like to be considered for a promotion, one of the most important things she addresses is you will not be in the room when someone is discussing your promotion. Maybe you've interviewed for it, people know who you are, you've submitted your resume, but it's the things that people say about you that are going to determine what your career path looks like. And one of the challenges that women face overall in the, work in the workforce is we have less sponsors and less mentors. And because of that, there might be a pile of resumes and a team of people are discussing, what do you think about John for this promotion? And someone says, oh, John is a really great worker, always exceeds deadlines. He's fantastic in terms of teamwork and really knows how to collaborate. And then someone says, what do you think about Sarah? And if no one has anything to say about Sarah, they pass on her resume and they keep going. And so the relationships and the brand that you have extend so deeply into your interview process that most people do not realize that when they don't get the job, it doesn't have much to do with your performance in most cases. When most companies interview you, either whether you're external and you're a candidate or whether you're internal for a promotion, if you've gotten the interview, you're qualified. They wouldn't have given you the interview if you didn't have a resume that said you could do the job. It's now the personal brand and the relationships that puts you in the position to win the role. So today we're gonna to cover four main components. First is how to seize opportunities to shine, develop your brand, know the players, and get on the bench. And I'm gonna be interweaving my story into this process. So the first piece of this I wanna talk about is seizing opportunities to shine. I was young in my career. I was a woman in my mid-20s in B2B sales at a Fortune 500 company, and I had been promoted already. So I started selling to SMB, and now I was selling to Fortune 1000 accounts. And I dreamed about being in management. So the first thing I had always learned from a lot of my mentors and sponsors was make your intentions known. I told everyone that I wanted to be in management. And this is important because it's, you can't just tell your boss or tell your colleagues. You have to make sure that people that are in positions to recommend you, people that are in positions to give you opportunities are going to understand where you wanna be and think about you when opportunities come up. So the very first thing that happened is I was selling to Fortune 1000 companies and there was a management position that the manager was going to be going for his wedding and honeymoon in Europe. He was gonna be gone for a month and they were looking for someone to step into the team and manage the team while he was gone. So of course, I made my intentions known. Pick me, I wanna be your acting manager. I'm interested in management, this is a great opportunity. Also because several other people in the department knew that I wanted to be in management, they said, you should give Allison this opportunity. What a great opportunity for her to step into a role, be an acting manager for 30 days, and get a taste of management. And in the future, when a management position opens, she would be a great possibility for it. Well, 
the challenge with this opportunity <laughs> in terms of thinking the opportunities that you want to shine in. I was in my mid twenties. I had no management experience. The manager that was stepping out was going to be gone for a month. And his boss, who was the associate director, was also going to be gone for a month because he was also going to this wedding and traveling around Europe. So there was going to be a current manager that was stepping into an acting associate director role. I was an individual contributor stepping into an acting management role. The team I was stepping onto had performance problems. There were personnel problems. I had never managed a team. And the person I was now reporting to had never managed managers. What could go wrong? <laughs> the answer is everything. <laughs> everything went wrong. <laughs> I had challenges managing employees that didn't want to listen to what I said or report to me because I was sort of like the babysitter and their real manager was coming back. There was no sort of expectation set that they should listen to me. It was sort of like she's here to help, not to manage. I dealt with performance issues from certain individuals. These are clean now. Yeah. Oh, someone's not on mute. Okay. Is everyone on mute still? Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> One little glitch, it happens on Zoom. So here was a situation where there weren't clear expectations set about me being able to really run the team. I was younger than everyone on the team, which really no one enjoyed. And so here I was in the situation where 30 days came and went. I walked away from the situation feeling exhausted, like I got nothing done. They walked away frustrated that this person was trying to manage them for a month. And at the end of the day, no one was really happy. And the feedback I got from management after that stretch assignment was, well, we gave you a shot. Didn't really work out. Don't think you're cut out for management. Now, at the time, that was absolutely devastating to me. But I really believed that I could do the job. So I said, well, I need coaching. I need development. So I reached out to different managers in the region and I asked them to mentor me, to coach me, to allow me to do things that would set me up for success. So my current manager, who was absolutely incredible and a major advocate for me, <coughs> excuse me, he started giving me opportunities to shine. When he would go on vacation, I would manage the team I was on. And those were my peers and we had good relationships. So it was a bit of a different dynamic. And he would allow me to forecast on management calls. I would step in and train new hires. He gave me a lot of amazing opportunities to shine and build my skills. But also, there was this impression of me in terms of my personal brand in the region that I wasn't cut out for management. So one of the first things that you really have to do, whether you're in a positive position or in a negative position when you're applying for a promotion, is solicit feedback. And the first thing you have to do in that process is remove your ego and let go of your defenses and really ask, what is it that I need to work on? Because as you can imagine, most people know what they're good at but what do we need to work on from an outside perspective? Implement that and provide proof. And whether you get that directly from your manager or a potential hiring manager or a mentor, make sure you're providing the proof that you've done what they've asked or you've shown that growth. And then the last piece around this is to activate your ambassadors. And your ambassadors don't necessarily have to be people above you or in leadership, but anyone who is on your team that believes that you're gonna be successful and a great contributing employee, they should be talking you up every chance they get and making sure that you have those opportunities to shine. And the reason this is particularly important for women is that there have been a lot of studies that show that men are promoted based on potential and women are promoted based on performance. And the interesting thing about my story is that there had been a lot of male candidates that applied for management jobs at my company and they either got the job or they didn't. As a woman, I was given an opportunity to do a stretch assignment. Now, maybe it just turns out that that was the opportunity, but I had to prove that I could be a manager before I was a manager. And based on the stretch assignment that I took, that was not the case. So women have to be more strategic, more vocal, and more proactive because they are generally promoted based on performance. The second piece of this is developing your brand. And this is really important because understanding your 360 degree feedback is at the core of it. If you haven't read The 360 Degree Leader by John Maxwell, it's a fantastic resource for you. And what this means from 360 Degree Feedback is you want to know how your boss feels about you, if you have direct reports, how they feel about you, how your teammates feel about you, how the cross departments you work with feel about you. For me in sales, I worked quite often with customer success, with finance, with legal, with operations. How do all of those people feel about you? 
And it's really important because the things that people are saying about you when you're not in the room are going to be your weaknesses and that you need to double down on those weaknesses and develop a plan. And a really good example of this is when I was working with a boss at one point in my career, I asked him for some 360 degree feedback and he came back with me, he came back to me with something I'd never heard before. He said, well, Allison, he said, you really don't keep me apprised of your projects. I don't understand what you're doing during the week. I don't really have visibility into your progress, into what your forecast looks like. And I was shocked. I said, well, we have a one-on-one -on -one every Thursday for an hour. Every Thursday for an hour, we talk about everything I've done for the week. And he said, yeah, on Thursday at two o'clock. But for the other five days of the week, I have no idea what you're doing. And I want to know more about what you're doing. And me, I was assuming that this communication had happened because we have a one-on-one -on -one, and he was telling me that he was in the dark. And this was just one perception of me. So he said, so my perception is you don't keep leadership engaged in what your day-to-day -day activities are. And for me, I thought this was so crazy, but then I sat back and thought about it and thought, well, that's because I, we have different expectations around what's going on. So what I did is I actually changed my game plan. I, at, at the end of each day, would send him a quick note on what I accomplished, what I need help with, what I was working on, what my plan was for the rest of that project or for the rest of the week. And our communication changed dramatically. And I went from someone that was being seen as someone who was independent and kept to themselves and didn't really keep leadership apprised to someone who was engaging leadership and keeping them in the know, which changed my value as an actual employee and how people saw me. The next piece of this is to know your unique value proposition. And I will say this to every woman, but you should have a 30 second elevator pitch about why you should be hired. And they call it the elevator pitch because if you were in an elevator in theory, riding from the top to the bottom of a building, you would be able to get it out in that amount of time. But it could be for your, your dream job interview. It could be you happen to be standing next to someone in Starbucks that wants to offer you a job, or you get to meet someone at an event that, at your company that is in a leadership position that might be hiring. You should have a 30 second pitch on who you are. And I think one of the things I've seen through a lot of candidate interviews is a lot of people focus their 30 second pitch on what they've done. But this is not an opportunity to read your resume to someone. It's an opportunity to summarize in just one or two sentences who you are as a professional in terms of your experience, and then talk about who you are as a professional and a person and what you would actually bring to that role, that company, that opportunity, and know what makes you unique. Now, people tend to default to things that they think people want to hear. They say things like, oh, well, I'm a team player, or I'm really organized, or whatever it might be. If you are really organized and that's one of your strengths, then you need to show that you're the most organized person they've ever worked with and give great examples. Or if you're a really great team player, you need to talk about how you've elevated your team's success based on your contributions. But make sure that you're going that next level of talking about what the impact has been and not just throwing out adjectives or phrases that you think someone wants to hear. And really develop what makes you special as an individual contributor or a leader and as a member of that team in that company. And then the last piece of this is to reevaluate, redevelop, and repeat. Because as you apply for different roles, as you go through different career changes, as you have different goals, you're going to need to redevelop your brand. And that is a key piece of this because the brand that you have as an individual contributor is very different than the brand you have as a manager. It's very different as the, at the brand you have maybe in your 20s or in your 40s or when you're early in your career at a company or when you've been a tenured employee. So making sure that the brand that you want people to see is lining up with how you present in your company. And the way that you continue to evaluate that and check that and make sure that's right is through 360 degree feedback. And then when you hear that something is not in line with what you want to present to the world, then you can make adjustments and go from there. And I think one of the biggest challenges that women in particular deal with in the workforce is that often sure, yeah. we ourselves. So it's a Zoom meeting, and why I'm not pressing the default. Uh, some sources with my computer, I guess I need to change. Can you please put yourself on mute? Okay. Um, I'm actually going through everyone and trying to mute them again. Go ahead. Perfect. Sorry okay. about that. So again, I think one of the biggest challenges for women is that often we see ourselves very differently than how the world sees us. And so making sure that you're constantly checking in, getting that 360 degree feedback, and that how you see yourself and how you want to be seen is aligned with how people are viewing you. And the next piece of this, which is just a truth of the matter, is that being good at your job is not enough. You also have to be liked. 
And one of the challenges I faced in my career and I still face in my career is I'm the kind of person when I go to work, I'm a driver. I put my head down. I work for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. I don't take a lunch break. Like that's just kind of who I am, right? And when I go into a work environment, if I'm in a cube or in an office, I'm the same way. I don't go out to lunch with coworkers. I, I sit down, I try to get my job done as efficiently as I can so I can go home and live the rest of my life. <clears throat> but during that time early in my career, one of the most difficult pieces of feedback I received on a 360 degree feedback session was that people didn't like me. And at the time I thought, well, why is that important? I'm excellent at my job. This is not a social club, this is a company. And the answer was, well, yes, you are excellent at your job and no one's debating that, but people also don't like you. They don't feel like they know you. They don't feel like they trust you. And at the time I was really just confused about the whole situation. But the thing that I think is interesting about this quote down here is that the biggest difference to your likability is the effort that you put in. And I changed my effort. So I started to go to work and I would eat lunch with the team. I would go out for coffee with people. When people would come in on Monday morning, I would ask them about their weekend and I would spend 15 or 20 minutes, you know, talking about what they did for the weekend. I started asking them about their personal lives. It was a, it really, how they, how people saw me as a team player, as someone they wanted to work with, as someone they trusted in the work environment. And this is also important for leadership. And if you are applying for a promotion, you can be excellent at your job, but that but it does mean that you have to build a relationship with them and make sure that you understand what they care about, they have a relationship with you and they feel like they want to invest in you. Because one of the challenges is when you're interviewing a lot of candidates, if all things are equal, if everyone is qualified and there are people that you like and don't like in the process, the people that are liked are going to be most likely to get the job. So the next piece of this is know the players. And before I go into know the players, I wanna continue a little bit about my story. So I went through this stretch assignment was told I wasn't cut out for management. I ended up applying for the job again. And at the time I was based in San Francisco. So I applied for the job one more time when an opening came up and I made the final two candidates and didn't get the job. So now I had applied for this job twice in Northern California. And both times I did not get the job. And through some 360 degree feedback, I was basically told stretch assignment didn't work. You're not cut out for management. You're a great individual contributor. No one is doubting that. You have a very promising future at this company, but no one's gonna take a chance on you in management. So it became very clear to me that if I wanted to be a manager and I wanted to stay at the company, which I did, that I would not be able to do so in San Francisco. So because I believed in the company and I believed in what I was doing, I made a list of three cities I was willing to move to and I started applying to jobs. Now I was doing this from San Francisco and this was you know, in the late 2000s, so before the days of Zoom. So literally it was a conference call that I was having with leadership teams. And I applied for the job another three times. And every single time I made the final two candidates and every single time I did not get the job. Now, the interesting thing about brand is here back in San Francisco, I had a negative perception of my brand as a potential leader. But out on the East Coast where I was applying, in the three cities I was applying to, I had no brand at all. Nobody knew me. I was working for a company with 200,000 employees. All they knew was my resume. And my resume showed I had a great track record and I was successful. So I kept getting to the final two interviews and I kept hearing things like, Allison, you're just so great, but we had someone else in mind. We don't really know you. So I thought, okay, well, this is something I'm gonna have to change. You, I'm gonna have to change this to make sure I'm known. So I went from taking conference calls on the first round of interviews to getting on planes on my own dime to go out and meet these people. And I showed up in New York for some interviews and people were like, wait, aren't you the candidate from San Francisco? <laughs> I said, yes. They're like, how did you get here? We don't pay for company travel for interviews. And I said, I paid for the ticket myself. And then I was like, because here's what needs to happen. You need to know me and I need to know you. At one point I was interviewing in New York City and the decision maker I wanted to meet with, he had to run out to the Jersey Shore at the last minute, which is about two and a half hours from New York City. And he only had a 30 minute window for me between like three and 3.30 in Jersey Shore. 
I rented a car and I drove out there to meet him. <laughs> he was the business to business director. And that was the 30 minutes that you're going to find out that changed my life. But going back to knowing the players, you have to know the players and you have to know everyone in their space. One of the interviews I went through at this company when I was interviewing for the global enterprise manager job, I had 11 sets of interviews. And one of them was with the head of customer success. And one of them was with the head of legal and the head of finance. And even though none of those people had the ability to hire me, they were all people that my hiring manager trusted. And they were in their spheres of influence. So understand who are the people's opinions that the leader you're interviewing with really care about and what do they want to know. The second piece is to build alliances with your allies, your sponsors, and your challengers. And your allies are gonna be wonderful. The difference really quickly between a sponsor and a mentor is the mentor is someone who is guiding you. The sponsor is someone that's willing to pick up the phone and advocate on your behalf and say, I recommend this person for a promotion. You should absolutely hire her. And then your challengers are the people that don't think you're right for the job. And while it's easy to just think, oh, if I just avoid them, maybe they'll go away. The truth is the challengers are the people that are in that room when you're not there discussing your promotion and explaining your weaknesses and why you shouldn't be hired for the role. I had a challenger, one of the people that um, I had interviewed with, who was not impressed with how I handled the stretch assignment. And I knew that she did not like me and she did not think I was cut out for the job. So I did the bold thing. I asked for some one-on-one -on -one time. I drove out to her office, had a one-on-one -on -one with her and asked her, I said, tell me everything that you don't like about me. Why am I wrong for this? Help me grow as an individual contributor and as a professional in this company as a person. And she gave it to me. She gave me all the things she didn't like about me. And then we started to build a relationship. And while that was one of the scarier things that I've had to do, um, within probably less than a year, that leader recommended me to go to a women's leadership conference at the company. And our dynamics started to change. So take the opportunity to get in front of the people that are your challengers, ask why, and see if you can resolve those issues and build that bridge. And part of the problem with this is you're going to find is that often you may not think the person is right in terms of how they see you, but unfortunately perception is reality and the way that they see you, especially if they're in a leadership role and they are not advocating for you is your reality. And so you have to get on board with their reality and figure out how to make it work for both of you. The next piece of this is to identify promotion and trends in your competition and any company, regardless of size, has core values that they support, and they have certain things that they prize in their employees. One of the things that was really prized at my last company was work ethic. And it was a very work-focused culture. You had, it had a get-it-done mentality, no excuses. If you have to get to the office early, if you have to stay late, whatever it is, you have to get your job done, and they prized that. And they really valued and promoted people that showed they had a strong work ethic and they would put the needs of the company first. Now, whether that's right or wrong, that was the actual culture that I worked in and I had to assimilate. So one of the things I did when I was especially looking to get promoted is I made sure I was the first one in the office. I made sure I was the last one to leave. Management would come in the morning. They'd come in early and say, Allison, what time did you get here? Because it's 7.30 and you've already finished your coffee. What time did you get here? I said, oh, I've been here since whatever seven o'clock or 6 45 working on x y and z and it also gave me a chance to talk to leadership early in the morning before everyone came in and all the, the chaos of the day started but understanding what that looks like and because work ethic was really prized there was one of the interviews i was interviewing for a position in new york metro and the hiring manager i was interviewing with we had had a great interview and then he went completely dark on me as an internal candidate I was calling him, I was emailing him, he wasn't responding. Well, he had told me in one of the interviews that he was a runner and he got up every day to run at like 6.45 before work. And that was the only time of the day that was really his because the rest of the day he was on conference calls, he was in emails, he was commuting, all of these things. So living in California, I set my alarm for 3.30 in the morning and I called him at 6.30 Eastern time and he answered the phone said, Allison, are you in New York? It's early. I said, no, I'm in California. He said, it's 3.30 in the morning. I said, this is the only time you said you were available. Do you have 15 minutes for me? He said, yes, I do. <laughs> he finally gave me the feedback about why I was not gonna get the job, which at the time was he had someone else in mind. 
Um, but he recommended me to a different hiring manager and said, I'm going to call this hiring manager right now and tell him that he should interview for his job. So making sure that you're identifying what are the promotion trends in terms of values, in terms of things people care about. And he actually said to me on the phone, he said, you know, work ethic is really prized here, especially in the New York market. And he said, and we, we really value employees that are committed. And he said, if you're the kind of person that flew out here for an interview on your own dime and woke up at 3.30 in the morning to call me, he said, if you commit to this job when you get it, as much as you've committed to your interview process, <laughs> I have no doubt you will be one of the best managers in this company <laughs> because you've shown me that you care that much. So identifying those trends and make sure you're showing it. And also keeping an eye on who has been promoted and what are the commonalities amongst those people? What are the themes that you're seeing? And knowing how to align with those and make sure that you are seen in the same light as the people that have been seen as leaders in the company. And the last piece is, is obviously know how to elevate your manager. One of the double-edged swords of being excellent at your job is your manager might be afraid to lose you <laughs> at any given time because it might create more work for them. It might create a gap in performance. Depending on what you do for your actual role, it could actually greatly impact the team or the company. So know how to elevate your manager. It can start with a conversation on what motivates them and what's important to them and really understanding that piece. Because let's say your manager is someone who has been in the role for a long time and they do not want to have a lot of training for their next employee. They want a seamless transition. They want people to pick up the ball and run with it. You need to then explain to your manager how you're going to create a succession plan and how you're going to transition this role to be seamless so that your business is not impacted, your customers aren't impacted, and their manager is not impacted by this. And it will be easy for this person to manage the new hire. If you have the opposite, maybe you have a new manager who's younger in their career, they're excited, they want to coach and develop, they want to help people get promoted, then you can position it as this is a great opportunity for you. You want to be seen as a leader that wants to coach and develop and get people promoted. If I get promoted, this reflects positively on you because you're the one that's been coaching me and developing me. So really understanding what that motivation is for your manager and then aligning your talk track with that to basically allow your manager to endorse you for the role, regardless of what it is. And one of the things we talk about in general, I think, is that women have a harder time asking for things. They have a harder time being upfront about what they want. And they also have a little bit of a harder time finding mentors and sponsors at work. And one of the things that I noticed in the promotion trends of my previous company is the dark horse never won the race. It was always someone who had relationships and who was being mentored or sponsored by someone who was in a high level place. Now that was just the company I was at previously and it's not the same for every company. But traditionally, if women have a harder time finding mentors and sponsors and men have mentors and sponsors, men are being thought of for those leadership roles because those mentors and sponsors are advocating for them. So it's more important for women more than ever to make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people that are gonna advocate for you and sponsor you for roles. And the last piece of this is get on the bench. So I talked about earlier about internalizing that culture required, whether it's work ethic, whether it's collaboration, whether it's an excellent customer experience, whatever it is that is cared about in that environment, making sure that you are internalizing it. And then you're asking for that 360 degree feedback to making sure that perception of who you are is reality of who you are. The next piece is obviously to prioritize and communicate what is more, most important to you and making sure whether that is work-life balance, whether that's a certain location you wanna live in, whether that is the type of role, the type of responsibility you want, continue to communicate it because A, people forget and they're busy, and then B, it might be changing for you. You know, one of the things that happened to me is after um, I did get the first management job, which I'll go back to in a second, um, at one point in my life in San Francisco, I decided I wanted to relocate to New York City. And I was approached for a promotion and offered the promotion in San Francisco and communicated excuse me, to the leadership at the time that I wanted to be in New York. And what ended up happening is that leadership made a phone call based on my behalf and I ended up getting a job in Manhattan and relocating. So making sure you're constantly prioritizing and communicating what's most important to you. And for me at the time, uh, I took a different type of promotion, but being in New York was actually the priority more so than the job itself. And so I communicated that I was flexible because originally they said, well, this job that we're offering you in San Francisco is not open in New York. And I said, well, actually I'm flexible. I just want to be in New York. So if you can get me any sort of promotion in New York that's in the space of what I do, I would happily take it to be in New York. And so then they were able to work with me on that because I communicated that. The third piece is really understand professional and personal motivations. And I say this in a sales process, but also in the interview process. 
everyone has professional and personal motivations for why they want to hire someone. And usually it's the personal motivations that win. So again, going back to if you have a manager that doesn't want to do a lot of training, they want someone to hit the ground running, if that's what you understand about them, then make sure you position yourself as a candidate that can do that. Or if you have a manager that is missing something on the team today, position yourself as the person that can fill that gap and bridge that gap for the team. And then the last piece, and this is the most important, I think, is ask for a spot on the bench and then play to win. So here I was in this interview process. I'd interviewed three times on the East Coast. Every time I kept hearing, Allison, we love you, but there's someone else we had in mind. It took me three times in the interview process to realize that what they were really saying is I have a bench and you're not on it. And these other people on my bench <laughs> are the ones that I am promoting. And I started to realize as I looked at the relationship dynamics that all of these leaders, they happened to be hiring men that were on their bench and they were male leaders at the time, but all of these leaders had people they were grooming for the role. And when the role came open, sure there was an interview process and sure they interviewed all qualified candidates, but the reality is every time the person they had been thinking of and grooming was the one that got it. So I didn't even know there was a bench. I didn't even know we were on a field. I thought we were on an equal playing field and everyone was going up to bat and everyone had a fair shot at hitting the ball out of the park. I had no idea that there was a bench. It didn't even matter if you went up to bat because I went up to bat so many times in the interview process and I hit the ball out of the park, but I was never on the bench next to the coach that wanted to put me in. So literally I got to the point where I said the last interview, the fifth one, I said, hey, I wanna know what it takes to get on your bench. And at the time he said, really? He said, how do you know I have a bench? I was like, really? Then he said, okay. He's like, here's the deal. He's like, I've got two people on the bench right now. I'd love to take you on and we'll see what happens. So fast forward, I applied for the job a sixth time and didn't get it again because one of the guys on the bench got it ahead of me because he was there longer. And then I'd gotten to the point where I think at the time, some of my mentors had said to me, Allison, you've applied for this job six times in a year and a half starting to look a little crazy. Like, I think it's time to give it up. Like you either need to leave the company or you need to stay at the company and think about a different career path. Now I was convinced that I was meant to be a manager and I was going to be an amazing manager. Problem is I couldn't convince anyone else of that at the time. So I decided to go back to my current role. I focused on being really excellent at my current job. And I asked my current manager who was amazing for a lot of opportunities. And he would let me get on the management calls and talk about forecasting or talk about pipeline review or coach new hires when they came onto the team. And he started to develop me into a manager. And at the time I said, I said, Michael, do you think this is a waste of time? Because it's been very clear that no one in this region wants to hire me and nobody on the East coast has room for me on their bench. Like, is this all a waste of time? I mean, should I just go back to my role or consider leaving the company? He said, well, only you can answer that question. He's like, but I think you're going to be a great manager. So I'm just going to keep developing you until the right person sees it. Then here's what happened. I put my head down working in San Francisco. And one of the associate directors I had interviewed with, the one who told me he'd put me on his bench, he was promoted and he moved to California and showed up in San Francisco. And that business to business director that I drove out to New Jersey to see. He was promoted to regional president and he moved to San Francisco. Now, I don't know if it was by luck or fate that two New York Metro leaders in a region, in a company with 21 regions were both promoted at the same time and they moved to my region. But they showed up in San Francisco and they were like, Allison, we remember you. We're gonna do some restructuring and have some management jobs open. Are you ready to be a manager? Now, at the time, I thought, this is it. I finally figured it out. But then something else happened. That personal brand I had in Northern California came back to bite me. And the leaders that were there, that had been there for several years, pulled these two leaders aside and said, no, 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 you don't want to hire her. We did a stretch assignment, didn't go well. She didn't know how to manage a team. And both the leaders said, well, of course she doesn't know how to manage a team. She doesn't have any management experience. <laughs> What did you think was going to happen? Like, what, what kind of coaching did you give her? Did you give her any classes to take? Did you, who coached her during this process? And they just sort of were like, oh, we didn't do anything. So they said, we're going to try this again. So they gave me another acting management role. So now I'm on round two of acting management role. And the previous manager had moved to a new role in the company. I took on one of the worst teams in the region. They were underperforming. They had a lot of issues. Um, and at the time, the associate director role of who I'd be reporting to 
was open. So I reported directly to the director, the man who I was on his bench. And he coached me every day. He called me every morning, every night. We talked about personnel issues. We talked about performance issues. During that stretch assignment, in the two months I was there, that was the first time that team had ever made quota as a sales team was working under me. And not only did they make quota, they were happy. And they called this director I reported to, all of them, and asked him if I could stay. And all of a sudden, the woman that no one wanted to hire <laughs> because they thought she couldn't do the job became somebody that could be successful at it with the right relationships and the right brand. So they offered me the job. I took the job. I went on to take that team who was the worst team in the region out of 12 or 13 teams to be the number one team in the region over the next year. I managed two other teams after that. And the last team I took who was an average team in the region, I took them to be one of the top 10 teams in the country. And that personal brand that I had had changed and my relationships had really propelled this. So then I was up for promotion and I was offered a promotion in Northern California as an associate director. But the truth is I had mentioned earlier at that time I wanted to move to New York and they made a phone call and they set me up with someone that I had connected with before. I had a relationship with him as well. I had a strong personal brand. And in the final interview, it was me and the CEO's nephew applying for this job in New York. <laughs> and the CEO of my Fortune 500 company's nephew was a top performer in New York. And everyone said, Allison, I don't know if you're gonna get this job. You know who's the other <laughs> candidate? And I ended up getting the job because I had the relationships and the brand. I moved my life to New York. And with that promotion, I then was tapped for a managing partner role. And the very last time that I ever applied into the general pool of applicants without having a conversation, just applied and hoped I got picked, was when I was applying for those first management jobs. After that, every single conversation that I had with someone I had a relationship with, who I was on their bench, is what propelled my next career move. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, doing things the wrong way. <laughs> and when I finally figured it out, I was able to put myself in a position with the right relationships and the right brand to make sure that I had the right career that I wanted. I ended up leaving as a managing partner after 10 years. Um, and then I took a career break and I moved to Africa. And I co-developed and led the first ever girls and women's empowerment program through East and Southern Africa. And I traded my suits and heels to be barefoot under the mango tree and work with girls, women, and local villages. And that is ultimately what brought me to Fairy God Boss. But I am so grateful for the opportunity I had on my career to learn how to navigate and to learn what was important to be able to put myself in position to succeed. And since then, I've helped a lot of other women, um, whether by mentoring, sponsoring, or just giving general advice to help get them to where they need to be and where they want to go. So when you're thinking about how to be promotable in everything you do, the four key components are seize opportunities to shine, which right now, regardless of what your company is doing, based on the state of the market and the state of the world, there are a lot of opportunities to put your hand up and to do more and to really position yourself as someone who's a leader or who's someone who can improve processes or improve the customer experience or whatever it is that you're doing. Number two, develop your brand and realize that this is a work in progress for your entire career. You will never have it perfect and it will constantly need to evolve based on who you are, what you want to do, and the types of people that work with you and how they see you. And do regular check-ins to make sure that, you're, that your perception is your reality. Number three is always know the players. And know the players, but not just the players, but the spheres of influence they work in and who is important in their sphere of influence and understand how to build relationships with those people as well. And number four is get on the bench <laughs> and then play to win. If you're not asking to be on the bench, it is very hard to get promoted. You need to ask. I said again earlier, if you don't ask, the answer is already no. The worst thing they can say is no. So you can only go up from there. So ask to get on the bench. Make sure you understand what it means to be on the bench, what it takes to get on the bench, and have constant and regular conversations about your goals and how the people that are supporting you can help you get there. So now that we've covered how to be promotable, I wanna talk just high level about Fairy God Boss for a few seconds and the resources that are there for you. I mentioned earlier, we are the largest career community for women. We also have the ability to be completely anonymous, so you can join anonymously if you would like. Part of that includes being able to get career advice, 
We publish seven unique articles a day around career advice and women in the workforce topics. And you could subscribe to advice that you particularly are interested in. So for example, if you care about being um, a woman in management and that's the advice you wanna get, you can ask for that. If you're a woman in tech, whatever it is that you want to focus on. There's also a community, which you can be anonymous in again, where you can ask questions, get support, share advice, share content, and really start dialogues outside of your normal network of friends, family, and colleagues. There are company reviews where you can leave a review for your current company anonymously, and you can also read reviews of other experiences of women in the workforce. And the fourth piece of what we do is you can come to search and apply for jobs at companies that care about gender diversity and inclusion and are actively trying to hire more women and have made the investment to do so. Also, because it's completely free for you to join, you can also take advantage of free resources like engaging in our free webinars. We just did a couple of webinars on, for example, how to overcome imposter syndrome, how to know how to direct yourself towards entrepreneurship. We did one on how to handle a bad performance review at work. So all these types of resources are available to you. We have a podcast series, Very God Boss Season 5 has just launched around highlighting executive women and telling their stories and their highlighting their journeys and giving advice. And you can engage with us in all of those ways as resources for you at any given point in your career from getting started to thinking about career switching to building a family during your career to being burnt out, whatever it is, there are resources there for you on Fairy God Boss. And you just have to go and sign up, click on get started. And also if you'd like to, if you are in the, the moment where you're looking for a new career opportunity, you can also upload a resume and LinkedIn profile and sign up for jobs as well. So now we would like to take any questions and comments, thoughts. First of all, let me say that was amazing. Uh, really, thank you. thank you for sharing your journey, really giving a lot of great you know, advice and everything. Couple of um, items on the chat window. One is saying, uh, I think it's Gayatri. You, you guys can also you know, unmute and ask questions, but I'll just read, read this one. What about the double bind of women? If you have seen as being likable, you are also seen as less competent. That's a good question. Um, I think it depends on how you're seen as likable. Are you seen as likable in like a chatty, friendly, bubbly way? Or is, are you seen as likable in a, I wanna work with you on a project way? And I think it's a small nuance. And I would say on the other side of it, one of the things I dealt with in my career several times is because I was not likable, I also wasn't considered for jobs. So I think the likable piece is sort of a delicate balance, but understanding what that, the relationship overall needs to be positive with the people you work with. It doesn't have to be too personal, but it has to be positive and people have to want to work with you. And that's something you only can really find out for yourself. If you do get that feedback in an interview or just in general, I would ask them to explain what that means and to give examples of why you're seen as less competent because you're likable. So for example, if they say, well, you know, we love that you come in every Monday morning and ask people about their weekend, but you spend an hour doing it. <laughs> so like you're seen as someone who's not there to be productive on Monday. That would be a piece of feedback you can work with. So I would ask what the specific feedback is and get asked for specific examples about what is translating an example where you were too likable and how that was seen as not productive. Um, Shala, if I may just uh, add here, this is Guy Three. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, uh, hi, Alison, great talk. Hi. So my question is really, it's coming from the technology and the scientific world. And I have noticed that usually when you're very competent and you call out people, you're definitely seen as less likable and less promotable. And I don't know if that's a difference between sectors or if you can address that in any other way. I have this happen to me all the time because I call out people all the time <laughs> and they do not always like what I have to say. <laughs> Even if I'm right, <laughs> it doesn't matter. So what I would say is, you know, one of the things I'm working on is how you call them out <laughs> and the language you use and the tone you use and the framing that you use. And it sounds like a lot of work. And to be honest, it is. It's so much easier just to be like, hey, no, actually we shouldn't do it this way. This is the way we should do it. Um, but it starts with, I think, making sure that, I think one of the challenges is when people see you as less likable, it's often because they're insecure 
about their own abilities. And when you call out something that might be a mistake they made or a decision they've made that isn't the best possible route, it makes them insecure and they go on the defensive and they don't like you because of that. Because the truth is people who are confident in themselves and their role and they want the best for the company and the team, they'll be like, tell me everything. You think there's a problem here? Tell me what it is, let's talk about it. Those leaders are hard to find though. So mostly what you get is people who are defensive, they're protective of their decisions, and now someone, particularly maybe even a direct report, is calling them out, which is a huge blow to their ego. So that's why they're not seeing you as likable. So what I would say is think about the delivery. Um, and it's a couple things. You can ask them in general, kind of offline, how they like to receive feedback. And some people don't like to receive very blunt feedback. Some people want to hear a positive first, and then they want to hear an opportunity, not just like, here's the, the problem that we're seeing. Um, the other thing is that you can think about, you know, how to best frame things where you have to use a lot of softer language sometimes with insecure leaders, but you can say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I can see why that would really work. Something else we could look at as an extension of that is doing X. And I know it's a lot of massaging and it's exhausting, but it's the reality of having to deal with leadership that is probably insecure and not as confident about their position. And that's why you become a threat. You know, the other thing is ultimately like you have to decide what kind of work environment you want to work in. So I would say if you keep running into leaders that don't want to hear your opinions, even if they're great opinions and they should be considered, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to continue to massage it and share your opinion? Is it worth it to look to work for a leader that's going to want to hear feedback? Because I will tell you that I have worked for a lot of insecure leaders in my career, but I've also worked for some incredibly dynamic leaders that were like, tell me everything you think. I want to know what you think, but that's a good idea. I haven't thought about that. Let's try that. So sometimes it's about working for the right people and the right environment. So if you try first to create an environment where you're not coming off as threatening and you're working with a little bit softer language and you're considering how to phrase it, if that doesn't work and the person is just like, I don't want to hear in your feedback, don't care or not interested, I know what I'm doing, then you might want to consider working for a leader that appreciates your perspective and your opinion. Thank you. Um, one comment here from Silky. Loving this talk can relate this to my experiences and mistakes. So just want to make sure you, you see what they are saying. And we have... We're in this together. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Yeliana is saying, thank you for, for a wonderful talk. Personal interactions plays very important role in career. What do you think will change in your advices, taking into account a current reality of virtual remote work environment? Yeah, good question. So what's interesting about this is I've actually been working remotely exclusively for the last three years. So I've been in a virtual environment before this all happened. Um, and there are some things I've noticed over time. The first is that, first of all, whenever you can do video, it's much more preferred than email or chat <laughs> or text. Like make sure you're taking the chance to actually see people and see them in person and build that relationship and ask for time. And time could be, let's just have coffee at 10 o'clock on Friday morning and catch up. Time could be a formal one-on-one -on -one where you want to talk about certain things. But I would say in a virtual world, over communication and more relationship building is the strategy for how to continue to build those relationships and keep just regular check-ins going. Even if you just say, hey, to your manager or to someone like a mentor or even someone you possibly wanna work for, I just wanna connect for 20 minutes every Tuesday. Um, make sure that you take those opportunities and ask for time on the calendar. I think people are juggling, juggling a lot more than they ever have in the past now with kids being homeschooled with Zoom and other just general things that are going on. So making sure that you are making that a priority effort because you don't have the same ability just to turn to someone in the lunchroom or turn to someone in the cube next to you and ask a question. So find opportunities to engage and create them. Perfect, great. And um, we only have a minute. Any other questions, please? You have uh, opportunity for one more question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me now. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, great. So just picking, uh, pick, uh, uh, looking at uh, Gayatri's comments about being likable and just piggybacking on that, uh, sometimes because of, uh, you know, where you're from and what is considered as a good virtue in a different, different culture, even in a workplace, you may sound as, you know, trying to be appeasing where you're not. 
right? You might be very, so, so there are various nuances of, you know, working with different uh, individuals and how a leader who might not have that kind of diverse experience to deal with their uh, reportees, you know, may not, you know, pick the uh, a, a nice and sweet voice in the in the room up for promotion uh, because sometimes the loudest voice in the room may get more brownie points and attention and so there's this thing about you know uh, competent but aggressive and competent but you know being nice so you know any any thoughts about that Alison? It's just my observation. Yes, and I went through this. So as you can imagine, working in San Francisco and working in Manhattan were very different for me. <laughs> and the things that were prized, I mean, New York for me was a very go-getter, say it how it is, don't waste people's time, be bold, be upfront and make it quick kind of environment. And it was just like, and just, it's like slapping people with information. <laughs> and then San Francisco and California for me were sort of like, hmm. We're going to be more laid back about this. Don't share your opinion too aggressively. Like just, you know, sort of check the waters. So I've been dealing with that dynamic my entire career. And I've moved from San Francisco to Manhattan, now back to San Francisco. So I've lived it on both sides and coming back to San Francisco after New York was a challenge. I think that you have to really try to figure out what is the culture you're working in and what is prized and align yourself with that. And my colleagues in New York will tell you that when I moved to San Francisco, I became much softer in my approach with a lot of things. Um, which might surprise some people, but like I just sort of had to assimilate to the new culture and then vice versa. When I moved to New York, I became a lot bolder and my voice was a lot louder because as a woman in the room, if I wanted to be heard in Manhattan, I had to be loud and I had to be bold. So I think you really have to just understand what your culture is and what's prized by leadership. And once you figure that out, and you can also have a conversation again around how do you like to receive information? How do you like to structure team meetings as terms of discussion and collaboration? Once you get the rules of the game, then you can play the game in a way that is going to allow you to be successful in the environment you are. And unfortunately, it doesn't always allow for you to be completely authentic. But if you're in a situation where you want to get promoted and you want to be seen as competent, often you have to play by their rules, not yours anyway. So, so it's, it's like cultural fit rather than cultural ad. Um, yeah, it yeah. is. If, if you're, well, if you're in a culture that wants something different than what you are, yeah. And then again, it goes back to the comment I said earlier, you can either choose to assimilate or you can choose to go find a culture that you're the culture ad and they want you to be the culture ad. Um, you know, one of the great things for me about working at a Fortune 500 company with 200,000 employees is there were my people and I found them. The New Yorkers were my people. <laughs> they saw me, they promoted me. People in California didn't see me, they didn't promote me. So there, there are your people out there where you can be the culture ad. And so it's up to you whether you wanna live in the world that you're in now and make it work, or if you wanna find a new world where you can be your authentic self. And either of them is fine, depending on where you're in your career and will allow you for success. That, that, that's really useful, Alison. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And with that, I really, really thank you, Alison. That was amazing. We are already two minutes over hour, but that was worth it. Thank you so much. Appreciate you know coming to our session. Everyone, thank you for joining, and we will uh, have the recording and also Alison's you know presentation that we will provide later. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.